Christmas. Welcome. Welcome whether you're here in person. Welcome whether you're joining us online. We're glad you're here. I don't think we have any announcements. I, do we? We have one. They don't believe I'm up here. <laughs> um, Thank you for all your prayers. Megan did receive a heart. Um, she, she had it put in on Christmas Eve morning. So that's our Christmas miracle. Thank you. I would remind you to, yeah, I'll catch my breath after that. Right? Um, I'll remind you to pass the cue pads down um, and sign in. And those of you online, you know, you're watching on YouTube, there's a comment section. Say hello, say Merry Christmas. Let us know that you're out there. For those of you here in the room, there will be tack time this morning, some coffee, some Christmas cookies. Um, so come, enjoy, uh, perhaps you know, have a cup of coffee while you're waiting for a Bible study to start, and then you can join um, Bible study um, at 9.30. Um, anyway, breathe. God is good, and no matter what they say, Christmas miracles do continue to happen. Open your hearts, your minds, and your lives to the miracle that just might happen in you today.
come and gather, for the Christ child has been born. We celebrate Jesus' birth along with choirs of angels, shepherds and bystanders, friends and family. Welcome. Please stand with me as we sing together hymn number 182, O Come, All Ye Faithful. We confess our sins before God and one another. Forgiving God, these past two years have been extremely challenging. We have not always risen to the occasion as we might. Sometimes we hid when we should have reached out. Sometimes we lashed out when we should have calmed down. Forgive us for all that we have done and failed to do, and restore us by your grace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the baby King. God does not remember our sin. God forgives us and makes us new daily. Receive God's merciful forgiveness and celebrate all that God has given to us, restoration, redemption, and new life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Psalm 102, verse 12 through 20. Psalm 102 is a prayer asking God for help and then quickly moves to a praise. We know that God has come to our aid in Jesus, in Jesus and so we pray. Our Lord, you are king, our king forever and will always be famous. You will show pity to Zion because the time has come. We, your servants, loved love each stone in the city, and we are sad to see them lying in the dirt. Our Lord, the nations will honor you, and all kings on earth will praise your glory. You will rebuild the city of Zion. Your glory will be seen, and the prayers of the homeless will be answered. Future generations must also praise the Lord, so we write this for them. From his holy temple, the Lord looked down at the earth. He listened to the groans of the prisoners, and he rescued everyone who was doomed to die. The Apostle Paul taught how the scriptures bless our lives. Listen now to his words as recorded in 2 Timothy. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kaolin, and thank you, Olivia, for reading the scripture. Our sermon on the steps today is coming off the steps, because I have a book um, to share with you, and I thought it might be better to be a little bit closer today. So I woke up this morning and checked the news and found out that Archbishop Desmond Tutu died early this morning. Um, he is a bishop of the Anglican Church in South Africa. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for the work that he did to fight apartheid in South Africa which was a system of laws that they had at the time um, that forced segregation among people of different races. So black people and white people were not allowed to get married. They were not allowed to eat in the same restaurants. They were not allowed to live in the same neighborhoods. They were not allowed to attend the same schools. Um, it was in the law that they had to be separated. And it was only 1991 that these apartheid rules were finally uh, ended in South Africa, so not all that long ago. But Desmond Tutu was a leader of the church there and was well known for speaking out against these laws and trying to fight for equality for all people. And since he died this morning, um, I thought we could read a little bit about him. This is a book um, that he wrote that's a kid's, uh, a kid's Bible, so it's the Bible stories, um, but paraphrased by Desmond Tutu. And this is the book that we've been giving out for several years um, to babies who are baptized here. So many of our families have this storybook at home. So the story from this Bible that I'm going to read this morning is uh, Jesus Blesses the Little Children, which is the, the artwork that they chose for the cover. Jesus spent many hours teaching people about God and how God loves us all. One day when Jesus was tired and resting, some parents arrived with their children. 
The children were giggling and laughing and running around making noise while their parents asked the disciples if they could speak with Jesus. What do you want with the master, asked the disciples. We want him to bless our children, said the parents. The master is resting, the disciples said. You can't bother him now. Go home. But Jesus heard them. Do not chase away the children, he called. Let them come to me. God loves children, and when they smile, God smiles. When they laugh, God laughs. And when they cry, God cries. Jesus went to the children, and they laughed and played together for a while. He took them in his arms and hugged them. He placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Then he told the disciples, everyone who wants to see God's dream come true must see with the eyes of a child. And finally, I'd like to read just a little bit of, there's a letter in the very opening part of this book, a letter from Desmond Tutu about this book. So I'm going to read just part of it for you. It says, Dear child of God, do you know that God loves you? The Bible says that each and every one of us is a very special person. God says, before you were born, I knew you. God made you just as you are so you could be your own unique and precious gift to the world. God made every one of us different, but God loves all of us equally, for we are all God's children. And no matter what happens, God will never stop loving you. God also wants to fill our lives with love. Jesus said we should love God, one, love one another, and love ourselves. How do we do this? By doing three important things. Do what is right, be kind to one another, and be friends with God. Will you pray? God, we thank you for the example that was the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We pray over his soul. We pray for his family and for all who grieve his death. Help us, God, to learn what he tried so much to teach, that all of us, no matter what color our skin or what we look like, all of us are created in your image and all of us are loved so deeply by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Sarah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. We'll get through this. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Reboam. And Reboam, the father of of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Aspa, and Aspa the father of Jehoshaphat, jump, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. 
And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy and mighty God, God of our ancestors, God of all that we are and all that will be, God of the baby born, born in Bethlehem. God, speak. Help us to find something good in this list of the genealogy of Jesus. Speak, O God, for your servants are listening. Amen. I'd like to get a little closer to We heard from 2 Timothy that all scripture is profitable. All of it. Now I get it that when that was written, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So the writer of 2 Timothy is saying all scripture, all of the Hebrew Bible, is profitable. I I'm certain he wasn't thinking about these 16 verses of if you read King James and so and so begat so and so, who begat so and so, who begat so and so. And yet, this genealogy, even though it doesn't agree with Luke's genealogy, made its way into scripture. So maybe, just maybe, there is something good about this list, these lists of names of who was the father of whom, and then the father of whom, and so on, to Jesus. I titled this sermon, Ancestry.God. The dot somehow missed it in the bulletin. Um, it was meant to be a play on Ancestry.com. Um, a few years back, we bought the kit and did the genealogy. Now, I should give you some background is to say that I am the eldest of three. And at one time, I had dark hair. Um, and my younger sister and then younger brother were both still blondes, were both blondes, and uh, are still, only their hairdresser knows for sure. But um, my dad was of German descent. Mom was of Italian descent. And so being the kids we were, um, because I had the dark hair, I was the Italian. And my brother and sister, being the blondes, were the Germans. And, you know, as siblings will do, that was a bit of tug of war between us throughout her childhood. Imagine my surprise when I did that little DNA test and found out I was actually more German than Italian in my genetic makeup. And my sister, who did the same, found out that she was more Italian 
in her makeup than German. I mean, on the books, it's supposed to be 50-50, right? You've got a parent from each. But in your biology doesn't quite work that neatly, that simply. And maybe, you know, if you see my sister, though she looks the more German, definitely in her actions is definitely the more Italian. She is the far better cook, even than my mom, and my mom would have admitted that. And she and my brother both, very Italian in that if they walk into the room, every single person gets a kiss, even if they'd never met them before. And I'm a bit more reserved on that. So maybe I've learned a little bit more of those German traits from my dad, and they a little bit more of those what we would call Italian traits. Now maybe it's introvert, extrovert, but, but that's the way we would have talked about it as kids. So maybe, just maybe, we can learn something about this babe born in Bethlehem a child still in the manger. And yet, if we know something about his ancestors, it might tell us something about him and the ministry he would engage in throughout his life. Don't worry, I won't hit everybody on the list. Because quite frankly, for most of them, their name on the list is about their only mention in the Bible, so we don't know a whole lot about them. But we know Father Abraham. We know he had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Abraham, the father of the three major monastic religious traditions on the earth the father of Judaism, the father of Christianity, and the father of Islam. All trace their roots back to Abraham. Abraham is the only God the Father type in all of Scripture. There are a lot of Christ types in Scripture, but only Abraham is the type, the model of the father. Abraham is one who receives a promise from God and remains true to that promise, though it would take years and years before they would have a child and even generations before they would, he become the father of a multitude. But he's remembered as a person of strong faith. Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And they are perhaps the first Christ type in scripture. For Abraham found Isaac and understood God told him to sacrifice the child, which was counter to that promise that he would have many children. And yet in faith, Abraham set out to do that task before God provided the lamb in the thicket. Isaac grew and was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of at least 12 sons, or 12 sons and at least one daughter. 
women unfortunately fail to get named in scripture. They were unfortunately considered property and not persons at the time of the biblical writings. Jacob's son, Judah, took a wife in the woman Tamar. She is the first of the women to be mentioned in this genealogy. Tamar was a resident of Jericho. And when Jacob was to fit the battle of Jericho, they sent spies ahead where they met Tamar. We don't know who's watching online. We're going to keep this G-rated. We're going to keep the sermon G-rated. So we will say that Tamar was a woman who was involved in the adult entertainment industry. Now, we don't know why those spies went to see her, but they did. And she hid them when the soldiers came looking for them and allowed them escape through her window, which was in the wall of the city of Jericho. And as they were escaping to freedom, she said, I have done you a kindness. I ask that you would do me a kindness in return, that you would spare me and my family when you come to lay siege on the city. And they did. And she became the wife of Jacob's son, Judah. They had a son, Salmon. Salmon married Rahab. I am sorry, I just told you the wrong story about the wrong person. That's what I get for holding my notes. So I'm going to give you Tamar's story and know that that was Rahab's story you just heard. Right? I got generations backwards. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Right? I got my names right. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. And by the practice at the time, she had a husband and he died before they had a child. And so by the practice of the time, his brother was to take her as a wife at least long enough that they could produce a child so that that child would receive his father's inheritance and thus care. The mother would then have the money to care for the child. It was also understood in that that this child would be born so that the brother, the dead brother, then would live on through that child. Well, his brother went, but he didn't go through with it. And because he disobeyed God and didn't go through with it, he died. Well, there was a younger brother and she thought that she was waiting for him to get old enough, but it became clear that Judah wasn't going to have his son meet up with her because two men had died who'd been with her. And so maybe she was the kiss of death. So we're just going to ignore her. So she tricked Judah. And as a result of that trick, she gave birth to twins. All right, so that's, we're up to Rahab now. 
Rahab is the mother of Boaz. Now, Boaz, we know because of that story of Ruth. Ruth, the Moabite from Moab, who was such an outsider that the writer of the book of Ruth had to say it twice, a Moabite from Moab. She was, wasn't one of us. She was an outsider. And when she went off with her mother-in-law, well, her mother-in-law and husband went off. They had two sons. The two sons got married. One of them married Ruth. The husband died. The two sons died. And Naomi, the mother-in-law, said, Ruth and Orpah, you go back to your parents. I have no more sons for you. To which Ruth says, my God will be your God. Oh, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you live, I will live. And she commits to Naomi. They go back to Bethlehem. She meets Boaz. They have a child. That child, Obed, becomes the father of Jesse. Jesse, you know, the shepherd, with all those sons, one would be anointed king. It wasn't the eldest. It wasn't the brightest. It wasn't the strongest. It was the youngest, the one who was left back to tend the sheep. David, who became the greatest king in the history of Israel. David, that conflicted soul, that great warrior, that great king. that great philanderer who saw Bathsheba, not even named in this genealogy, the wife of Uriah, it says. That woman bears a child. And that child has a child. And so through, we get through to Joseph. What do these ancestors tell us about Jesus and his ministry? This genealogy that names and includes women. This genealogy that welcomes the outsider into the community. This says volumes about who Jesus will be, the ministry he will grow to serve. Now, I know somebody here this morning is saying, but this is Joseph's genealogy. And we know, or at least we understand, that Jesus had no part in Jesus' birth other than being there. Joseph, an adoptive father. But then there's the question, is it, is it nature or is it nurture? I believe this line of ancestors through Joseph nurtured Jesus in part to become the person he would become. And maybe the greater lesson is that each of us are nurtured in the community of faith, that we might be more faithful followers of Jesus Christ and take time to be grateful for our ancestors in faith. I don't know how many of you were watching. I imagine a few were. The interview 
with Aaron Rodgers after the game yesterday. They told him, well, you know, how's this feel to beat Brett Favre's record? He says, I'm thankful for the coaches. I'm thankful for the time I spent learning from number four. I'm thankful for those who have come before, who helped me to be where I am. So too, this morning, as we celebrate the birth of a child, we celebrate all who have gone before in his life and all who have gone before in our own, that together we might learn and grow in our faith. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand with me now as we sing together hymn number 185. Don't look in the bulletin. It's hymn number 185, um, Joy to the World. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, we thank you in this joyful Christmas tide for all the blessings we enjoy the shelter of home, the comfort of family and friends, the company of the faithful with whom we celebrate Christ's coming, and for your love which shines as a light in the darkness. For these and many other blessings besides, we offer our thanks and praise.
God of mercy, in this holy season, there are people in need of your tender mercies. We pray for those who are ill and for those who are recovering, for those whose sadness is made heavier by memories of Christmas past or by some present pain. We pray for those who do not have enough, enough food, enough money, enough companionship, enough hope, because there is not yet peace on earth. We pray for those in harm's way. Protect them from war, violence, and cruel oppression. For these and many other needs, we offer our intercessions. God of hope, through long ages you have given your people dreams and a vision of a time when there will be no more war, no more pain or sorrow, no more death. We pray this day for the time to be fulfilled when we will be reconciled with one another and to all creation, to you as well. Fill us with hope as we wait upon your coming round. Give us the will to work for justice and peace and the courage to follow you, follow you into every place. We thank you for dreamers and visionaries who respond with imagination and joy to what you are doing in the church and in the world as we remember them before you. As a new year dawns, we know that all our times are in your hand. We entrust ourselves and those we love to your care. We pray together as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves the grumpy ones, too. We have been richly blessed. We give to say thanks. We give as an expression of our discipleship. We give so that others might know the love of God, the faith of Christ, and the spirit of community. For these reasons and more, the ushers will now receive our morning off offering.
Please pray with me. We are blessed to be your servants, Lord. We are ready to respond to your call to provide to others. Accept these gifts to further your work in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. service begin. Go from this place to show the light and the life of that Christ child born in Bethlehem. Go as people of faith to be Christ for the world. And as you go, remember that the God who created you, the Christ who redeems you, and the Spirit who empowers you goes with you this day and evermore. Amen.